Direction point. Direction point. A Doctor Who Podcast Network. Hi everybody, welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. I'm Jason. And I'm Stacy. It is Saturday, the 1st of April, no fooling, and we are here with a bonus episode. Stacy, what is the book I have asked you to discuss today? The book today is The Eight Doctors. When the history of Doctor Who literature is written by podcast hosts far wiser than myself... What will be the final word on this Terrence Dix 1997 masterpiece, the first book in the long-running Eighth Doctor Adventures series? It was the first book in the long-running Eighth Doctor Adventures series. <laughs> I'm noticing a remarkable amount of unenthusiasm from your end. <laughs> the book, no, the book, the book is fabulous. The book, the book is Terence Dix uh, having a blast. And I think that when the book is read as the, the first book in, in, you know, a brand new line, of course, it's like, you know, when the doctor has just regenerated. And of course, you, you initially hate the new doctor, um, and then you grow to love him eventually. And this is the book that launches the Eighth, doc- Eighth Doctor series. And it's Terence basically having a laugh. And th- it's actually surprisingly fun. You and I were both there in 1997, which feels like about six minutes ago, but my calculator tells me it was actually more than a quarter century ago, which I don't know how that happened, first of all, but somewhere on the internet is a repository called the Doctor Who Ratings Guide, with which you may or may not have some passing familiarity. I I vaguely heard of it. (laughs) I want to read to you a couple of the curated reviews of the eight doctors from the Doctor Who ratings guy. This is from April 1998, less than a year after the book came out. Let me start by saying that The Eight Doctors is the most awful, turgid, rambling nonsense I have ever read. From beginning to end, it was uninspired, uninteresting, embarrassing tosh, filled with facile prose and infantile plotting. If this was aimed at the same audience as The Virgin New Adventures, then it failed miserably. However, I can't even imagine a 10-year-old reading and enjoying this rubbish. That was Matt Michael, who I believe this was one of his audition pieces to become the official DWM reviewer, which he then became. Yes, that's right. Is Mr. Michael being a little unfair at our friend Terrence? I, I, I think that uh, it's it's the kind of book that provokes strong opinions, uh, for sure. Uh, I completely disagree with him, by the way. I think a 10-year-old would absolutely love this. I think a 10-year-old would find joy in it. And I think that's probably the market that, that Terrence is leading into. And even though we are recording this on April 1st, I do want to say that I picked this book up a couple of years ago during the pandemic. There is an Eighth Doctor's Adventures group on Facebook, and they were doing a group reread of the series. And I made it through like the first eight or nine books before just losing my patience with some of the early 1998 offerings. But this was the first one I read, and I was surprisingly enthused by it and all the hate that i recall for the book 25 years ago just fell away and i really had like you say a blast reading it but i want to read you a second review from the ratings guide and this also came up in 1998 this book is a sorry retread of terence's past populated by characters who call themselves the third doctor yet behave in a way in which no third doctor i've ever seen would the suicidal seventh doctor and the quote weird fantastic improbable end quote telemovie are just two victims of cheap shots terence has decided to fire in a novel which is itself full of improbable events that sadly aren't tempered by being fantastic in any way shape or form first question is that reviewer being fair and second question who is that reviewer (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure I couldn't possibly say uh, it was me. Yes, well, at least me with a different name. Um, uh, yeah, I, it reflects my thoughts at the time, for sure. Um, I I think I 50% stand by it, and I 50% completely disagree with my past self. <laughs> I, I think that that it, it, it depends heavily on the context. So in 1997, we'd just come off the end of the New Adventures, and the New Adventures were completely beloved. I think that, by myself included, uh, they were such a great series. I still think of them as the golden age of Doctor Who. Among all the different golden ages we've had, to me, they are still my favorite. And I think when you see something like the Eight Doctors, it looks like this sort of shot across the bow of the new adventures. They're, they're kind of trashing the, the 
Seventh Doctor, they're trashing his adventures that he's had lately. It's also trashing the TV movie. It's sort of trashing everything in some ways. Um, <laughs> and I think this was very difficult to to absorb at the time um, and I understand the vitriol that a lot of people have for this book um, because it was difficult. It was. It looked like the new order has turned up and the new order is now dumbing Doctor Who down for kids. And I think in the wilderness years, we were very, very precious about what Doctor Who was. And it felt like we really had to make sure that this maintained its kind of status as something that was, that was sacred and precious and for adults, not just for kids. And I think in the modern age, now that we can look back 25 years later and we can see, oh yeah, Doctor Who's in no danger of being overridden by people who think it's only for kids or something like that. It's 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 doing just fine. Um, and I think if we look back, the, the Eighth Doctor's is, is not actually that key a text in many ways. It's not the key text that we thought it was in 1998. Uh, this is a book that is, you know, one of the early Eighth Doctor adventures that are pretty well known to be pretty awful. Um, it's it's not suddenly going to like sweep away the new adventures. The new adventures, I think, have locked into kind of like the, the zeitgeist as being a really, really special thing. Um, nothing is going to take that away and certainly not the Eighth Doctors. And so I think we can kind of like have a bit more grace towards the book. Uh, and taking it on its own terms, which I did with the recent reread, thanks to this podcast, um, I found there's a lot to enjoy. It's, you know, it's Terence being Terence, of course. I think also the fact that Terence has passed away made me a lot more indulgent towards this than I might have been before. Um, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a guy playing his greatest hits because that's what the public wants. <laughs> and, you know, he's reliably churning them all out and he's going to keep doing that. And I, I think that, you know, there's there's a market for the eight doctors somewhere um i don't think it was the new adventures reading fans um, i don't know how many 10 year olds there are actually reading the books at this time um, but there were probably a few so they might have enjoyed it um it, the eight doctors seem to you know work for some people i, I think that the the eighth doctor adventures some people really enjoyed i enjoy many of them i'm rereading them at the moment i'm about three quarters through um i enjoy the later half much more than the first half but there are definitely people i've talked to who actually absolutely adore like the eighth, eighth doctor adventures much more than new adventures and that's perfectly valid uh, we all have different tastes so i think with the passage of time my my attitude is mellowed as as well <laughs> maybe i'm becoming a bit more like terence dicks here <laughs> i want to read you a third review and then we'll talk about the book point by point there is very little about doctor who that cannot be learned by reading the eight doctors this book is nothing less than a complete epistemology of doctor who <laughs> i i think it's trying to be this kind of like complete beginner's guide to doctor who i think that that that's at least feels like the aim of the book i don't think it succeeds fully but i think it it does give this sense of like you know what is doctor who like well, read the Eight Doctors and find out. And and I think that's that's as close as you were probably going to get in 1998. I think it's very very difficult to kind of present this kind of ur text that says here is Doctor Who. Doctor Who is such a complex show and and series of books as it was at this point and comic books and every sort of thing that they could possibly be. How do you actually sum up Doctor Who in a single work? It's very difficult. Um, and I think Terence has kind of gone back to an old playbook, which is that the five doctors seem to kind of do it. So if five doctors was good, eight doctors is only going to be better. <laughs> Let's have more. And yeah, uh, that's that's where we went. <laughs> well, the five doctors only had four doctors in it, and this one has eight. So this is literally twice the doctors. Yes, yes, and and you know they 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 all get some amusing scenes that kind of go a bit off the rails here and there. Um, I and I mean I I actually also appreciate the attempt to do something new. Um, I, I think that the sixth Doctor segment, for instance, is is really trying to develop the character more and develop the background story more. Um, this whole new like you know time lord intrigue happening um it's not just a, a revisit of the, of the greatest hits which i think the first couple of doctors really are in many ways so just to give you some context for that third review that i read to you that was written in july 2000 which is also the year that the ancestor cell comes out which is a very divisive book in doctor who fandom because it destroys gallifrey which of course now happens every few years on the new series mm -hmm. And it gives the Eighth Doctor amnesia, and it's the breaking off point in the book between the Steve Cole era and the Justin Richards era. So after Ancestor Cell, things get a little bit better. Before that, they were clearing the decks of a lot of a lot of the Lawrence Miles, not, not Lawrence Miles himself. Alien Bodies is still one of the best books I've ever read. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the authors who came after Alien Bodies were trying to do Lawrence Miles, which you could only do if you're Lawrence Miles. So for a couple of years after Alien Bodies, the EDAs kind of fell into a sort of Lawrence Milesy blind alley. 
Ancestor Cell clears the deck. And after that, Justin Richards comes in with a six-book arc that is completely continuity-free, one of the six being written by Terrence Dix himself. So that review was written in July 2000. The reviewer is me, writing under a pseudonym. I may or may not have told you this before. But we were in the middle of a very vicious debate at the time about the fate of the EDAs on a mailing list that you and I were on. So I got this crazy idea that I was going to go back and I was going to write a series of wildly enthusiastic, tongue-in-cheek reviews of all the EDAs and all the bad ones and talking about how good they were. This made it through two reviews. I then did a review of the next book in the series under the same persona, but it ended up just being a straight-up pretty hard-hitting criticism of a book that I liked in spots and didn't like in other spots, so I retired the persona after that. (laughs) This was my attempt at being witty and whimsical, so I completely disavow it now. It was where my head was at 25 years ago. (laughs) But having read this now, I think it's easy to write off the book as Terrence recycling himself. So the amnesia plot is perhaps not super original, but bearing in mind that this is the BBC taking over the line and doing a big publicity launch for the longest time. This was the best selling Doctor Who novel ever. I think it was since supplanted by one of the books that came out in connection to the new series in 2006, but there was a big launch. So this book the Doctor has amnesia because the audience has amnesia. There's going to be a lot of first-time readers who don't know the Eighth Doctor. He was only in one TV movie, which was not very well received, especially by Terrence himself. So you're starting again by taking the Eighth Doctor's memory away and showing him who he is. So the first couple of segments, especially the visit to Unearthly Child Part 3, just seems like the Doctor walking his way through home movies. But that's deceptive because the rest of the book builds to a point and all these things are happening on purpose. I think what this really is, is Terrence trying to fix the end of trial of a Time Lord for his friend Robert Holmes, who was supposed to write the end of trial of a Time Lord and then passed away before finishing. I think this is Terrence trying to go in and restore Robert Holmes' good name and give us Trial of a Time Lord Part 14, if not Part 15. And it turns out that everything that's been happening in the book up to that point is all to a cosmic design, and it's all for the Doctor to come back and save his home planet. So I think there's actually a hero's journey in this book, and what we were thinking at the time was just stupid retreads and bad photocopies. It's actually all to a purpose, with the exception, of course, that the suicidal seventh Doctor on Metabilis III, had there been an editor in charge of the books in 1997 who knew Doctor Who, somebody might have said, maybe this part you want to, you want to, you want to try again. Yeah, I, th- I think it does read a bit like a first draft, actually. And I think a, a, a stronger editor, I think, could have made actually a much stronger book out of this, um, because I think some of the ideas are, are perfectly reasonable as a first draft. <laughs> they just probably shouldn't have been published as a book and, and then become the best-selling EDA for, <laughs> like, like I, I think that's just, it's just a bit unfortunate. Um, I, I find myself a lot less invested, though, in, in the, the issues of it. Um, I think there's many ways in which, though, it, it, it as you say, it does, it does kind of predate what happens. Um, uh, I mean, the EDAs, I, I think, are generally speaking, a little bit doom and gloom for the first half. And so, you know, they're not the strongest of books and then they get very, very strong later. Um, so this kind of predates the first half. But I think it also predates kind of like, you know, I think obsessions with continuity were seen as a really bad thing in 1998, right? It was, it was something that was really frowned upon. But I think now if we look in kind of like, you know, Marvel movies and sort of, you know, Disney-fications of Star Wars and Star Treks and so on, the continuity is everywhere. And this is now a thing that mainstream people are into. Um, and so, I you know, I, I think I remember bad-mouthing kind of like continuity you know, as, as kind of a concept um, to one of my girlfriends once. Um, and she was like, oh, no, I love all that stuff. I love going to a Marvel movie and noticing, you know, links to other things. And I was like, I think times have moved on and and they really have. And so so I think in that sense, like, you know, continuity is back in favor again and, and it's not the end of the world. I think also, you know, with the internet, you can just look stuff up if you don't know it, which we couldn't really do so easily back in 1998. Um, so so some of that is is all good. Um, the, the new companion, Sam, like, you know, initially looks like kind of this really kind of like left-wing kind of cliche as written by a right-wing person and so on. Um, on the other hand, she's kind of also who a lot of us became. Like, she's anti-racist and she's vegetarian and she's, you know, like like very much against injustice and so on. Like, she's actually not that bad. And that actually continues to be true throughout the EDA. She gets a bad rep, but I think, like, a lot of the rep just kind of creates itself. Like as, as I, as I read through all the Sam novels recently, it was like, 
she's not wonderful. I think she's done a disservice by the fact that we don't see her likeness on a cover. I think that might have made a difference. Um, um, but you know, th- th- there's there's better companions out there, but she's not actually all that awful either. Um, and so I think a lot of the problems with Sam. I think sprung out of the fact that people really didn't like the eight doctors and therefore just kind of put everything onto the, like the, the, the one major thing that came out of it, which is Sam Jones is now continuing as a companion. You raise a couple of really good points. Let's unpack some of this. So you talk about Sam being a caricature of a young left-wing activist written by a right winger, especially on the DVD commentaries, which came out about a decade after this, Terrence would play the part of the grumpy old house Tory, I think from what I've heard, he was anything but in real life, and he was a lot more left-leaning than he would let on. This, of course, is the person who script-edited Barry Letts and put out five years of Doctor Who at its most quote-unquote woke the first half of the 1970s. I think Terrence was a lot more sympathetic than a lot of us realized at the time, especially the way that he would talk on the DVDs. On the DVDs, he would say, if you want to, to send a message, hire Western Union or send a telegram, but he was actually the one who was sending these messages out as the show's script editor, script editing Barry Letts year after year after year. So that's one point. I think Terrence is not quite the right-wing nut job that he might be remembered as. The other point is, I don't think the problem with Sam is this book. I think what Terrence was trying to do is recreate Doctor Who from the beginning, because it's Sam at Cole Hill School and a hip male school teacher, that a female school teacher. He wanted three companions. That did not go through. So we have Trev, who in this book has a two-page discussion of what is crack cocaine, which was one of the most derided bits of the book in 1997, I'm here to tell you. And I think, <laughs> still to this day, doesn't hold up very well. Um, Trev is mentioned once in the next book, Vampire Science, and then never comes back again. So Terrence wanted to have an ensemble cast, who else is doing an ensemble cast uh, with three companions, Doctor Who, with the Chris Chibnall series starting in 2018. So this was an idea whose time came around again. Secondly, I think the Doctor and Sam in the last couple of chapters, when she formally joins the TARDIS, have really good chemistry. So the problem is not Terrence. The problem is that all the other writers decided they didn't like the idea of a teenage activist on board the TARDIS, and they tried to fix Sam which leads to a line of books where Sam becomes very strident and has to learn lessons by being insulted by the villains. And then there's a line of books in 1998 where Sam is killed in every single book in increasingly gruesome ways before the character is finally written out in 1999 after just about two years on the printed page. Sam comes with a lot of baggage, and I think she could be reevaluated in certain lights, but this book is not the problem with Sam. It's everything else that came after. Yeah, so I think the one the one thing I would really respond to that is I think that uh, you, so you used the word right wing nut job. Uh, I don't think Terence was ever a nut job. I think that the right wing back in the the day, and especially not even in 1998, but Terence's era, which is sort of 1970s and so on, right wing was not like it is today at all. And I think there were people on the right who very much believed in like you know the you know you you have the right to say anything you want. I will you know I might not agree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I think that that was very very classical of the kind of the you know, even the caricature that Terence sometimes played of the right wing Tory was very much like, well, of course you can you can say things that I don't agree with. Um, so I don't think that was that was really particularly ever on the cards. Um, and I guess we can we can debate a bit about Terence's politics from what we know. And I think we both met him in, in different circumstances, but it's hard to know and it's hard to sort of I guess really tease out what the political <laughs> views of, of someone who's passed away really are. Um, but but I do think that it is worth noting that 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 was of a different time. And sometimes somebody who was right wing in the past can actually look rather left wing these days, which uh, sadly, as you know, time marches on, <laughs> it doesn't always go so well. Um, that it certainly happened for political figures, for instance, like the former Prime Minister of Australia, who was very right wing at the time, ended up on the left. And he said, I never changed my views in the slightest. <laughs> and he just stayed where he was. So, you know, I think I think factors like that can happen. And I think it's very also very good to remember that Terence was significantly older than anyone else writing for these books. That the, Mostly it was kind of these, you know, young pups kind of coming through and then Terence, the grand old man of Doctor Who kind of popping in to kind of like you know just <laughs> kind of have a bit of a laugh and, and, and it's, I think as he famously said continuity is what I can remember and so you know he's pretty much writing it all down at this point it is true when you go back and watch some of the old sci-fi series if you watch 1960s Star Trek or the original 1989 to 19 
83 run of Quantum Leap. The politics there are more what nowadays would have been called liberal republicanism rather than uh, mm. left-wing progressivism. Uh, again, that's a point that can be debated by smarter people than myself. I think Terrence was trying to have Sam be a fun, young character who could be molded. And I think the other writers took it the wrong way and decided that Sam was a problem that needed to be fixed rather than a fun companion that we could do fun things with. And she ended up being taken in some pretty dark directions. I don't think that's on Terrence at all, especially because the idea was she would have school two school teachers along for the ride, and those two characters did not get picked up. I, I think the other thing to think about is is the the uh, companion that um, Terrence sort of most recently helped create was Sarah Jane Smith, um, who was kind of, you know, this young, very left-wing kind of like, you know, women's liberal of the day. And that became very successful because of the fact that people lent into it and they really worked on that and so forth. And and I agree with you. I think that it's what the other writers do that had they lent into this, this could have been a great companion. Um, and I think you're right. They, they're trying to fix stuff. And I think the problem with the Eighth Doctor Adventures, at least at the beginning, is they're, they're trying to fix things all the time. I think Terrence is trying to fix the TV movie um, and other people are trying to fix other aspects of the TV movie. I mean, it seems like that the Eighth Doctor's kind of like characterization was built on two fundamental things. He is not half human and he doesn't go around around kissing people and they didn't really give him a character they just they're like these things must not happen and well what does happen we don't know like you know let's give him amnesia because we don't really have an idea and and this this really is a stone around the neck of the character for quite some time and i think sam is kind of similar it's sort of like you know this what's meant to be a broad sketch then becomes this problem that must be fixed and everybody's fixing everything and then they're fixing the fixes and and it kind of collapses under its own weight after some point you can't fix a broken plate by breaking it further, as somebody yeah. once said. That was actually a line from one of the Doctor Who role-playing game novels of the 1980s, Doctor Who and the Rebels Gamble. Ah, very wise. Yes. Uh, that was not written by one of the uh, in-house stable of uh, television writers. That was written, I believe, by an American games writer. That's an interesting point. Maybe I'll cover those books on a future April 1st episode. <laughs> But that is a life lesson that I learned from a Doctor Who role-playing novel that I've never forgotten 40 years later. So it must have been a very good point. But a lot of the choices that Terrence makes in the story, Doctor Who is going to pick up and embrace once the show comes back on the air. The idea of Three Companions comes back. Cole Hill School comes back as a character on the show. The Doctor coming back and rescuing Saving Gallifrey comes back on the show. There's a line in the book about the Eighth Doctor not being the one you were expecting. That becomes literal text when Stephen Moffat writes the Night of the Doctor minisode, which is part of the official canon, even though it was not screened as a proper Saturday night episode. So I think Terrence is either way ahead of his time, or he has ideas that other writers are going to consciously or otherwise put into the show when it comes back to TV. Especially the idea of the five doctors being a cultural touchstone and a story that you want to come back and revisit for your book. He literally revisits the Eye of Orion. He literally has the Rastin warrior robot massacre a horde of aliens, although it's not the Cybermen, it's the Santarans this time. And it's not the third doctor watching, it's the fifth. But the five doctors is still a touchstone. If you go back and watch Day of the Doctor in 2013, all that ever wants to be is the five doctors retold with a lot of the dialogue quoted again. So this book, I think Terrence is really touching on ideas that are going to be mainstreamed to Doctor Who and brought back into the show. Doctor Who in the 21st century, and I'm saying this on April 1st, but I really do mean it, at least to, to a large degree. Doctor Who now looks a lot more like the Eight Doctors than it resembles the other EDAs in the line. Yes, I I, I think you're right, uh, and I mean may, maybe that's a tragedy in some people's eyes, but I actually think that people have made it work successfully. Um, I, I would say other things that I noticed is. Um, uh, uh, Sam Jones, um, you know, talks about the Doctor's pseudonym, John Smith, and she makes a Smith and Jones reference. And of course, that predates one of the Russell T. Davies titles. Um, and then there's an even even greater one, though, which is that um, the Master's motivation um, is that he wants to become the Doctor. And and so the Master at the end, when he goes off to become the, the death worm of the TV movie, it's specifically because he wants to be the Doctor. And that's exactly power of the Doctor. So, you know, we, we have this right up to the present day, which is quite amazing, actually, if you think about it. 
it's absolutely incredible. So again, this book was not very well received at the time, but not only that, the idea of fixing plot holes is still part of Doctor Who's DNA. I mean, Chris Chibnall spends two years with a storyline that is meant to explain a 15 second clip from the brain of Morbius. So you can hardly blame Terrence for wanting to fix the TV movie because the modern day showrunners are still trying to fix the whole things, especially if the rumors about who Neil Patrick Harris's character is going to be for the coming David Tennant mini season later in 2023, which has not yet aired as we record this on April 1st. I think what Terrence is trying to do here is very much a part of uh, Doctor Who's uh, mainstream. We might not like that he dislikes the TV movie. We may not like that he dislikes the Seventh Doctor to an extent. But this is what Doctor Who does. One era reacts to the next. One era tries to explain the past. There's a constant rewriting of the show's mythology going on. It's easy to make Terrence a whipping boy, but I think what he's doing is completely normal. So it's, you know, the past explained, the future foretold, and the present apologized for. (laughs) To quote one of my legit favorite stories, Creature from the Pit, which is literally my bio line on Facebook. So speaking of correcting mistakes from the past, this is an abbreviated episode of Doctor Who Literature because I have a full-size episode coming out tomorrow, and I don't want to strain my audience's listening capacity. You and I met at Galley six weeks ago. And we did a live recording at Galley for our Enemy of the World episode. And we played a game. And this was a game that had never been played on the show before. And the only reason I played it is because for the first time ever, we were sitting at the same table, you and me, and for a very brief moment in time, Warren Fry. Yes. <laughs> I mean, maybe kept that in. I thought you would edit that bit out. And I was very amused to hear that on the recording. <laughs> you were just stone cold, completely... You had the funniest reaction. I, I was getting congratulatory texts on your reaction to Warren's inadvertent intrusion. <laughs> that, was just, that was just absolute gold. Plus, Warren is a great guy. So that's the, yes. probably, the, probably the only time he'll ever be on the show, unfortunately. But uh, it's a better show for having his voice in it, even if only for 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but we played a game. We played a guess the quote game where instead of me playing you or showing you on Skype a video clip, I would read out to you a quote and you would have to guess the story. As we were walking away from the conversation, I realized that I had left out one of the greatest quotes of all time that would have been much more identifiable. So we are going to rectify that by playing the game again. So even though we are recording this over uh, the internet, I am going to read you out or perform for you three quotes from the classic series, and you are going to name the story, you will name the episode part, and for bonus points, you will name the person who is speaking the line in question. Wow, okay. Are you ready? Bring it on. It's your last chance for boozing when there's no one to mind. It's your last chance for losing and the first place you'll find four days ride from the station. You'll leave it at noon and your one consolation is the last chance saloon. Well, that is so clearly from the episode that you and I watched together. Uh, which, of course, is Let's Kill Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> I just, of course, it's it's the gunfighters. Uh, I, I, actually, I must say, I, I don't know if what specific episode that is from. I, for me, the song is just kind of ever-present in the gunfighters. Um, I'm assuming you picked a verse that is only in one episode particularly. Uh, and as a random spin of the dice, I'm just going to say episode three. So you and I did watch The Gunfighters and Let's Kill Hitler on the same night, and that was the last night of the first L.I. Who in 2013. We watched part four of The Gunfighters, because that's where my then pilgrimage was at, and we watched Let's Kill Hitler, because you were working on Outside In, the new series. Yes, I, I was actually doing my own pilgrimage, and and I think I I split up with the girlfriend, and we were watching it, and that was the next episode that we hadn't watched. So ah. I thought, well, I'll continue on. <laughs> I, and I was enthusiastically explaining for you how The Gunfighters is a musical because this music is being piped live into the studio and the actors are performing in time to the music. It makes it literally musical theater. So the verse that I just did was the literal part one cliffhanger that was performed uh-huh. by Peter Purvis as vocalist. And it was – he is standing at the piano. The Clans are holding a gun on him. Right, right. Oh, that's right. I forgot that the music comes into the episode itself, because I was, I was going to say Linda Barron was, was the singer, but actually, no, it's Peter Purvis. Next episode, Don't Shoot the Pianist, which I would love to get on a t-shirt. 
<laughs> All right. Are you ready for your second clue? Ready. There is no glory greater than to serve with gold the son of man. No riches here on earth shall see. No scootage in eternity. Do, 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 do. Yes, well, that is definitely the King's Demons. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, well, it's Chameleon as King John singing, episode two, I believe. Yes and no. It is performed in both episode one and episode two. Part two, I think. He performs it as Gerald Flood, as King John. Yes. And then it's the robot prop. Oh, it's the, yes. Singing awesome. along to a pre recorded track in part two. Yes. Yes. I, I was I'm determined not to get caught in this episode part thing that you you dinged me on last time. <laughs> <laughs> that was my bad. Yes, it was part one and part two of the King's Demons. Yes. There's been a lot of hate for the King's Demons going around the, the internet and the podcasting sphere. I, I love the King's Demons. I have defended it on other shows. And when it comes up again on this podcast, I will have very kind things to say about it. Unfortunately, I don't believe you are going to be my guest for that episode. I have pretty much booked you through to the end of the series, but I don't think King's Demons is one of the books that I have you down for. Yeah, you know, I, I threw in the King's Demons at some point. I think it, when it was released, it was released with the Five Doctors. And my, my random roommates, who were not Doctor Who fans in the slightest, they kind of like poked their heads around the corner and sat and watched the whole thing with me. It's, it's very accessible TV. I watched it when I was 11. It was one of the first stories that I watched. Because remember, I came into the show with season 20. I came into the mm. show during a heavy continuity period. And that continuity is what made me a fan of the show. I'm like, I want to see these episodes that are being referred to. So for me, the song in The King's Demons was, was a big deal. I love the song. It's an absolute earworm. It's, it's a banger, mm. as, the, as the kids say, or as perhaps the kids don't say, because I haven't been a kid in quite some time. But that song has been stuck in my head for about 40 years now, much like Ballad of the Last Chance Saloon. And I hope it never <laughs> leaves. All right. We got, we got one. You've already won. You've gotten two out of three. But are you ready for I'm number ready. three? That's the way to the zoo. That's the way to the zoo. The monkey house is nearly full, but there's room enough for you. That, that, is, that is Gwendolyn singing in Ghost Light. Uh, episode two, I think. Maybe no, maybe it's episode one actually. So I think she sings early on. You are incorrect. It is part one. They did episodes after 1979. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and for bonus points, can you name the actress playing Gwendolyn? Oh no, I don't think I can. That's I'll know her name when I hear it, but I I don't have that at my fingertips anymore. It's been too long. I used to know these things. It shows you where my memory is getting at because I was listening to a different podcast talk about Seeds of Doom a couple of months ago, and they were going through the cast and just praising the cast one by one. And I realized I could name every single actor in the cast of the Seeds of Doom, but I could not for the life of me remember the name of the actor who played Sir Colin. And when they mentioned the actor's name, it was as if I had never seen it before, even though I've been watching Seeds of Doom for mm -hmm. decades. And I, I know... John Chalice, uh, Mark Jones, Michael yeah. McStay. I remember all this stuff, but I could not remember the name of the guy who played Sir Colin. And when I heard the name, I'm like, I've never heard this name before. And I've been watching the show for 40 years. How did I forget that? So to lead in, I know pretty much the cast of Ghost Light as well. I can tell you that it has John Hallam. I can tell you the, uh, that, that it has, for example, Call Forgione, who had also been in Planet of the Spiders, yeah. and I recognized him. But mm -hmm. Gwendolyn is played by Catherine Schlesinger. That's it, yes. And who who plays who plays Sir Colin in Seeds of Doom? I believe it was Michael Barrington, and I have watched oh, Seeds of Doom. Yeah. yeah, I've watched the credits of parts one through six a dozen times each yes. at least. And yeah. when I heard that name, I'm like, I don't know that name, and I've never heard it. I must have memorized it, but it completely, completely went out of my head, and there was just no recollection left. <laughs> yeah, Michael Barrington as Sir Colin. Wow. Everything else I could name, but that one has been lost to memory. So yeah. Catherine Schlesinger, I didn't remember either. So that's yeah. – uh, thank yeah. you, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and that conclu that concludes our game of Guess That Quote. You are the absolute winner. And, of course, it is, it's a little bit of a cheat. Those are the only three songs, I believe, sung in the entirety of the classic series. So. There weren't a whole lot of choices, and they're all pretty easy to place. Uh, doesn't John Pertwee sing something? 
he sings snippets of stuff from time to time. Beneath the lullaby. Um, yeah. And uh, he sings, I don't want to set the world on fire. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Right before the TARDIS console blows up. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then he sings La Donna Mobile at the beginning of Inferno. But that's just him. That's just him singing. These are these are songs that actually yeah, advanced the plot. The songs that right. I sang for you. Right. He was just yeah. singing randomly in the background. Mm, okay. Peter Davison sings a little bit of No No Nanette in Black Orchid. Hmm. But nobody's going around cosplaying as Peter Davison singing in a bathrobe, a silk bathrobe, singing songs from No No Nanette. Whereas the songs that we did were a lot more, I think, <laughs> integral to the story and a lot more memorable. I, I think I could sing as time goes by about as well as Sylvester McCoy does in the happiness patrol. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I bring you back for April 1st next year, I think I will just sing all the songs that Pert we sang and ask you to name the episode that he sang it in. <laughs> That'll probably be the clue. <laughs> Amazing. All right, Stacy, anything else that you want to plug before I let you go? Um, I have a couple of books just about out, um, but those books are not Doctor Who related, sadly. Uh, I have a popular science book, The Top 10 Diseases of All Time, will be out imminently. I also have just submitted a guide on how to write for scientists. Uh, that's a much more scientific kind of book. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I'm at at the moment. I will actually I'll have the next um, classic outside in, um, classic Doctor Who redone. Um, that's going to be out in a few months, I think. And you should be back on the show at around the time that comes out. So I'll give you a proper plug for that. Plus my role in that book. Exactly. (laughs) Next time that you're here. I do want to point out in closing that when you and I were talking, when we recorded Enemy of the World, we mentioned plague episodes of Doctor Who. We talked about Praxius. The very next day, you gave a talk at Gallifrey One at the uh, scholarly panel. You gave the keynote speech talking Mm -hmm. about pandemics and Doctor Who. And you said that after Doctor Who and the Silurians, which was the centerpiece of your seminar, Doctor Who never did a pandemic story again. But you were working from your slides, and we had just discussed Praxius the night before. Yes, you had yes, put it into yes. your slides. And I was sitting there in the back of a very, very crowded conference hall going, Stacy, you forgot Praxius. I, I actually did not forget. It was actually in my head, and I was thinking of you in our conversation as I was saying it. But I still don't think Praxius was a pandemic per se. I think I think it has disease elements. Uh, I mean, many many stories do. There's lots of infections in Doctor Who, in this case of Androzani, and there's sort of backstories in Death to the Daleks and other things. But I think that's quite distinct from an actual pandemic seen on screen. We see the potential for one in Praxius, and several characters yeah. die of this transmittable mm-hmm. illness over the course of the story. But what makes it more pandemic-y or pandemic adjacent is that it aired on the day that the first person in the Western Hemisphere died of COVID. Yeah, and of course, right. two months later, we're all stuck at home for the next three years watching Doctor Who and launching podcasts to increasingly smaller audiences. So Praxius was kind of the opening bell for COVID. But one of my favorite parts of, of that season is is at the very end when, you know, they're done with the cyber war and they return Graham and Ryan and uh, <laughs> to like 2020 and they're like, hey, you're going 2020. And it's like, uh, actually, can we go back to the cyber war, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stacy, thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully we have given Phantom a lot to reevaluate in terms of the eight doctors and Praxius and King's Demons and the gunfighters. We talked about a lot of unpopular stories, but I enjoy them all. Well, most of them. Praxius is up for debate. And uh, I think we are going to have a new phase of critical good feelings towards the Eight Doctors. And I think it's all due to this show. I think we are going to be the show that saves the Eight Doctors and makes it a foundational text for Doctor Who going forward. Thank you very much for helping me in this salvage mission. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Look, I, I always say, like, even even bad Doctor Who can be really fun. Um, and so I think that the Eighth Doctors can be super fun. It doesn't have to be the greatest thing ever. It could just be something you really enjoy. And I must say, I enjoyed the last read that I did of it. And, and I'm really appreciative uh, to you for making that happen, because I would not have otherwise chosen to reread it. Someone that I respect very much has said many times, Doctor Who can survive being bad, but it can never survive being boring. The Eight Doctors is never, ever boring. I, I don't think Terrence Dix could be boring if he tried. And I will say, maybe as a lead-in for next year, last night, just for fun, I read the prologue to Shakedown, which is another Terrence mm. new adventure with a less-than-stellar reputation. I thought it was absolutely incredible. I just love his writing style. I love the characters that he does. I, I mean, I think mm. 
Terrence is underestimated as a storyteller, even if his prose was not quite of a match for the rest of the Virgin in-house style. As a storyteller, you really cannot beat the way that Terrence sets a scene. I, I, I adore Shakedown, actually. I, I was shocked by how good it was last time I read it. And it's such a unique beast in Doctor Who. It's this sort of like fan video that got turned into like a novelization that doesn't have the Doctor. So they have to kind of build this entire like thing around it so that you can have this middle third that doesn't have him on it. Um, and then it sort of has Benice going to this planet. Like it's, it is such a weird beast. And yet Terrence makes it work and you barely even notice the joins. And that's incredible for because that thing has so many joins in it. Next April 1st, 2024, Stacy and I are back to discuss Shakedown. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, catch you later, Stacy. Thanks again. Fantastic. Thank you. Direction point. Direction point. A Doctor Who Podcast Network.